is how can a distributed team still collaborate closely? And I think that there is no closer form of collaboration than, uh, than pair programming. So with me to demonstrate this, I've got with me uh, Niruka um, Ruhanaga from Sri Lanka. Say hi, Niruka. <laughs> and later we will be demonstrating remote pair programming. But the more important question than how can a remote team uh, collaborate is how can any team collaborate? So I'm hoping uh, that even if you're not working remotely that you will be able to use some of the techniques that we'll go through to work better in your local team as well. So before I start, I'm going to give you a little bit of a competition, which is to find the blue sentence in the talk. So whoever finds the blue sentence will get some extra chocolate plus, plus an issue of our exclusive XLE magazine with lots of technical articles. All right. So here's a hint. This is the first word in the blue sentence. All right. So uh, you should keep the rest of the words secret so you win the prize. So this is a talk for you. If you're working on a team, so who's working on a team? I thought so. But it doesn't really feel that much like a team. It doesn't feel like a team as it does in the movies. Whose team feel like it does in the movies? All right. So we want our teams to feel more like the teams in the movies, or at least um, the teams in the books. And even more, how do we get our distributed teams to feel like the teams in the movies? After the talk, I hope that you'll be motivated to start working with pair programming, even um, remote, uh, remotely, that you'll have seen an example, hopefully a successful one, of remote pair programming, and that you have some idea of how to get started. So uh, is there anybody who's uh, pair programming, uh, using pair programming as their preferred approach to how they work in their team. So you got, so could you keep your hands up, up? So there's one, two, three, four, five people here. So the rest of you, take notice of these people because you want to talk to them afterwards. So I'll go through uh, what it feels like um, when, you're, when you have a team that feels like a team in the movies. And then I'll talk about what it's like when you don't have a team like the ones in the movies. And then I'll talk about how we can use pair programming to create that super team and to get the benefits out of it. So what is it like to work on a super team? I think that the most essential thing is that you don't feel like you're working alone. You feel like there's somebody else out there so you feel like we're together in this. And I'd like to share with you an experience that I had just before the last time I gave this talk. So uh, my college, uh, college uh, Chintaka, had just started working on a task. And he was kind of stuck. And he saw that I was online. And we had been discussing this before. So he um, started a chat session with me and said, OK, so um, could you give me some clarifications on some problems I have? And uh, then there was uh, a, a simple clarification on how things were supposed to work. And, um, and then his first problem was solved. But then it seems like when he started testing his application, he had one of those bugs that feels like a rabbit hole, you know? Uh, so it seems. He says, I, uh, it seems that I'm not getting the people I have already created when I try and access this thing. So his, his solution just doesn't work when he tries to integrate it. And he's wondering if it's because he's using a trial account on the service that we're accessing. Now, this is one of those rabbit's holes, because that was not what the problem was. So have you ever had that situation where you're like, OK, that's where the problem is, and then you'll spend all your time trying to figure to fix that problem, and it turns out that it was completely different. That's the rabbit hole. That's where we don't want to go. So we sat down and we started working together. And 
The first thing we do when we start working together is to get a shared context. So what are we working on? In this case, we wanted to see the same results on his computer and on mine. And uh, then we share some experience. So in this case, we were trying to get a REST-based web service to work. So I had some experience using curl to do kind of low-level checking if it works. So I told him how to get started with that. So we already have some sharing of knowledge. And then we're starting to uh, uh, experiment and try and find out what's going on. And I think I see the problem. Uh, and then I say, okay, so this is a problem, but it wasn't, of course. So we're trying things out together. And uh, uh, then we're creating this thing called, that I think of as a working baseline. So we had the example that didn't work, we created an example together that did work, shared that. Um, so he got that to work, and then we got to that moment that you, that takes a while to get to when you're uh, alone, but not so uh, long when you're together, which is the, huh, that's strange. So it acts differently when I try and do what I thought was wrong on the system we're testing and the system that we know is working. So there's something that's strange here. And then um, he spots it, and we verified both that it worked. And from he called me up until his problem was fixed, it took about 20 minutes, where 10 minutes were spent finding and installing some tools where we're really off on our own. So the clock time is, 10, uh, is uh, 20 minutes. And that's what it feels like to not be alone with your problem. So uh, when, you're, when you're alone, you have those situations where you run down the rabbit hole, you're hitting your head against a wall for hours. When you're together, that goes much faster. And uh, just uh, for, a, for a reference, I asked him if I could use this transcript for the talk. So that's um, some fun collaboration that happens remotely just as easily as it happens locally. And it shows how you deal with problems when you're not alone. So what does it feel like when we're on a team where everybody's alone? So this is the example of the team where we're all alone. And you have the Scrum Master, only two problems with Scrum Masters, the word Scrum and the word Master. All right, so of course the Scrum Master helps us plan our work. So he says, Johannes, you'll create the CRUD, service, uh, CRUD SOAP service for the project applications. Okay, I'll do that. That's how we self-organize around tasks. How long will it take? I've never done this before, I don't know. But luckily there is a developer on another team who says, oh, this is pretty easy to do with Hibernate. Oh, cool, uh, let's say eight hours then. There is a warning here, when developers estimate in hours, something is wrong. But that's another issue, especially when there's something they don't know. All right, so we've planned the work and we're doing the stand-up. So the first thing here is that I was alone in the system, right? because I was the only one on this team that could do it. There was a developer on another team that gave me some information, but I had to do the estimate. So we've got the standard meetings, the three questions at the standard meeting. Today I will work on create projects. Yesterday I did the planning, so that's not so interesting. And I have no impediments, because I don't know what's going on, so how can I have any impediments? And then I start working. And so headphones are on, I'm sitting on my own code is flying out of my fingers until the exception happens. So I got some kind of exception and of course what do you do when you're when you get an exception and you're working alone? It's uh, the software development lifecycle, Google driven development. If you get an exception you Google it, you're, if you're lucky you find it on Stack Overflow, you tweak, tweak what you do, you redeploy the application, you poke it to see if it happens again, and of course it happens again because you only skim the top of the article. So you Google again, and you, and so it goes. So this is this is our life cycle. We start after lunch, and then we keep working for a few hours and a few more hours, and then eventually we go home. And then we've got the next stand-up meeting. And yesterday I worked on the create project uh, story, 
And today, hopefully, I'll fix that damn exception and also do delete project, because, you know, the first story was only supposed to take um, eight hours, but I've already spent more than that. But hopefully, I'll be able to do both, catch up for the time. And of course, I have no impediments. Because everybody else has got their problems. They're working on the front end or as uh, on the database or with the design. So I'm stuck here alone with my exceptions and my hibernate and all of that. All right. But this time, it was I was lucky because somebody answered my Stack Overflow uh, problem report. And here's the, the fix. So I fixed the problem. And then I can get back to work again. So headphones on and focus on the problem until the other exception happens. And then we got into the Google-driven development again. So, and the next day, so hopefully I found the, the fix for this. And then the next day, I said, OK, I finally delete, uh, finished delete after three days of coding. And then, of course, the front end developer who was going to use my service says, uh, well, I didn't need the delete service. I only needed to create an update. Except that, of course, he doesn't say that because he doesn't know why I did the stuff that I did anyway, because I'm working on a different part of the project. And that's where we need to stop and take a step back and look at what we're doing. So let's imagine that we're supposed to carry 10 logs of timber from this room to the next room. And each uh, piece of timber is three meters long and weighs about 30 kilos. How would you go about carrying the, that timber? Would you do it alone or would you pair up with someone? Right. And um, so when we're doing development, we've got fairly heavy loads that we're lifting. Do we do it alone or do we pair up? Right, we do it alone, but we probably should pair up. So, yes, he's... Um, uh, Niruk, are you back? Yeah. <laughs> so we do lose connection every now and then. You can re-enable your uh, video. So the video drops when the call drops. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> can you still see my screen? Sorry? Can you still, still see my screen? All right, so I worked on about 10 teams closely, and the three most fun teams I worked on, they worked something like that. So we have the stand-up meeting, and at the stand-up meeting, I'm ready for a new task. So we look on the board, we see what's there. So the first thing is that we haven't already assigned all the work, because, I'm the, not the, um, because if we have assigned the work, then I cannot help someone else, because then I will slack off of my work. So I look at what's on the board. So um, let, let users administrate their project is on the board. All right, so we'll do that. But I haven't done any Hibernate before, and this looks like something that requires Hibernate. Is there anyone that I can pair with? And then someone says, yeah, sure. Uh, we'll pair together today. I worked with Hibernate before. I can help you out with that. And then we work together. So now we're working um, on the same screen, or if, and then we get to the exception, and... Yeah, so technically we're not working on the same screen because we're remote, so we're working on different screen, but we see the same thing, and we see the same exception. The same exception as before. And then we might be in the same situation as before. We maybe do a little of Google-driven development, but of course we're saying uh, we have someone else to account for our time. So, we, so I might say that link doesn't seem really relevant, and we might take a step back and say, okay, let's See, what, how else can we figure this out? Uh, could we ask for some help? And um, uh, I think that Niluka has worked on this sort of thing before. And he's sitting right next to one of us uh, with his pair. And he says, yeah, just have a look at this other class where we did the exact same problem. And he might not even need to get out of his context uh, in order to help. And now we know that the information is getting shared among the team. So there's always someone there who knows. And then we found the problem. High five. 
So in this sort of model, uh, there is no area that anyone is dedicated to. If I'm a back-end developer, it means that I can help someone else do work on the back-end. But, or I can work on the front-end with help from someone else. And that means that the knowledge is spread around the team. And it means that when you're stuck, which I think most of us as developers are stuck more than a couple of times per day, you're not alone. So how do we get to that sort of happy state? And I think that the key process that we, that will give that team feeling of the team that you see in the movies is pair programming. I'll introduce a few pair programming styles and I'll demonstrate one of them. So there are some ways to do it uh, wrong. Um, I have one very good friend and, and um, a, um, a experienced developer, bless his heart, who always wants to debate the name of a variable or whether the casing is correct or whether we designed this right. So everything is slowing down. So that's not what it's about. It's about helping each other go faster and helping each other learn. Another uh, very, so a useful way of thinking about it is to, is uh, the model called the driver navigator. No, that is, that is a different model. This is a very cool model, but I don't have time to talk about it. It's, it's very cool. But here's another that's easier to talk about, which is um, if I know something, then you're the one who's typing it. If you know something, I'm the one who's typing it. So the information never goes through the, uh, out of the head of the person who knows and through the keyboard. It goes through the head of the other person. It's a um, very useful way of making sure that people are uh, getting faster. Another of my favorite ways to do pair programming is very useful in a training session, and it's often called ping pong programming. So it consists of some ingredients, and it kind of wraps together the core part for me of extreme programming very well. The first thing, pair programming, we've got two people, one at each screen. In this case, it's me and Niruga. The second ingredient, test room development, which means we write a failing test before we write the code that makes it pass. So we write the test, we make some, write some code. We write some test, we write some code. And then the third ingredient is that we're refactoring all the time. So we refactor when the code is green. And if we put it all together, um, one person writes the failing test, another person makes it pass, that person writes the failing test, and the other person makes it pass again. And we do refactor in between. So um, in this case, I think I'll be writing the first failing test, and Niruka will make it pass. Does that work for you, Niruka? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's the actual demonstration. So we got Niruka on the other end, and the problem we'll be working on is uh, converting numbers to text. So I briefed you on the problem beforehand, Niruka. Could you uh, uh, review what you, what you learned about it? Yeah, so could you just uh, could you just explain the problem that we're solving? Uh, yeah, uh, this one, uh, we are trying to get it. We are trying to create a function that uh, when you pass an integer number, we want to get the English word for that. Uh, let's say if you pass one, we have to get one. If you pass 150, we have to get the text 160. Right. Like that. Yeah. So I, I've made a structure that gets the number is up to about 100 to work, but then I have uh, um, this new test, 145. So I wrote the test just before I connected to you, and uh, when I run it here, uh, you'll see that it, um, uh-oh, <laughs> it Dropbox failed, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> All right, I think we might have to switch model. So if the, if the test fails, uh, yeah, so it doesn't uh, make uh, this test pass. So it says 145, but it doesn't know what to do with 140. So uh, do you wanna, do you have the code on your end? Yeah. All right. I'll um, share your screen. I'll see, I see a screen. See if I can zoom it as well. 
All right, so I hope that the audience can roughly see it as well. All right, so uh, you get the same uh, problem on your end? Yeah, so we're not, so the code that I wrote uh, doesn't deal with numbers bigger than 100. So uh, I think you can just do the same thing roughly as for um, for the 20s. Yeah, we'll uh, check for the more than 100 here. And then for now, I think you can just return 100 and, and then convert the rest. You mean just to return 100 here? Yeah. yeah, so say 100 and, and then you can call it personally for the rest. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're going to do that. All right, does the test pass? <laughs> um, one hundred. Yeah, so forty is spelled without the U. One of the um, confusing things with the English language. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it should be factor this thing. Yeah. So. Uh, we we'll use the convert function here. Yeah. Uh, we'll... So when we divide by hundred, it will uh, get us one. That sounds good. One, yeah, one will uh, be coming here and uh, it will return one and plus. Then uh, it's 45. Yeah, that should be supported by the... Um, uh, Rewind, yeah. So you need to say, have space before 100 and then and afterwards to get, the, and then the and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that should pass. Ah, brilliant. High five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. You want to write the next test? I think it should work. I think the next thing should be thousands, right? Thousands, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So maybe do like 5,400 and something. 5,456 or something? Yeah, that sounds good. Perfect. 5,000. F O U R. All right. So try and run it. Yeah, it's ready. Yeah, you got a, a, a C at the end of six there. So the end yeah. of the string, yeah, is it? 5400 something, so. Yeah, I'll take over, so make it pass. Yeah. All right, so can you see my screen? Mm, yes, no, I can see. All right, so um, I'm running the test to make sure it fails on my end as well. And here there, you put in an extra C there, so I'll just remove that. Okay, so the, it says 5,400 for six, it says 5,456. Oh, that's, that's pretty straightforward. We just need to do this again. 
So, <laughs> thousand, and then I'll just flip the rest into the convert function, right? This? Thousand, it should be thousand, right? Uh, yes. Right, so that should do it. Ah, brilliant. High five. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um, still, yeah. Still easy. Still easy. So, what's next? Hmm. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. So, if I do 100, then that, that would fail that. Uh, that wouldn't match that block. So, I think that would uh, fail. Uh oh. Right, so it says, uh, doesn't know what to do with 100. Do you want to fix it? Not yet. All right, so it's still um, uploading here on my end. So, um, uh, yeah, it's got it. Good. So I think somebody in the audience had an idea what was wrong. But all right, so go, let's go to the numbers to English there, yeah. So the first problem is that it's um, a greater than or equal to if that's going to work. But if you, if you make it equal, the end will come here. Yeah, all right. Let's just add it to the, to the uh, switch then. 100? Yeah. And you have to say 100. Yeah. And I think you need to remove that greater than, or, yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice. Nice, high five. <laughs> All right, now somebody in the audience said that this and is probably not going to work so well. So let's try 200. So that fails because it says, uh, don't know what to do with zero. Yeah, so it was trying to say 200 and zero. Shall I take over? Yeah, sure. All right, so running it again. So I guess that if the number is exactly divisible by, uh, 100, by um, hundreds like this, so then we have to do something else, right? How, what do you think of this? Uh, yeah. It's, how do you like that, Naruka? Yeah. Any refactorings? I don't play. Yeah. Um, I think we'll leave it at that, but um, because we need to return to the topic. But I saw one other problem. So there is, like, if we say 5,006, you say 5,006, right? But the, the, the and comes from the hundreds, so that will fail. So how do we deal with that? So it says 5,006. I think we'll leave that one as a puzzler to the audience. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, uh, Niruka, what does it feel like to program like this? 
Yeah, uh, we all know that uh, the astronomy is a uh, fun and uh, really very very that long topic is a uh, very famous thing now it is. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to our countries uh, that uh, the offshore companies like us, uh, it is really important to have this kind of uh, collaboration between them. When our colleagues are friends and uh, we start the link to our working on site. Thank you. So, thank you to Niruka, huh? <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, now you've uh, seen kind of what pair programming can do to transform a team, and you've seen how it works in a remote uh, setting like this. So, how do you get there? The first thing that is imperative to make pair uh, programming work is to make the act of sharing or to make sharing into goal for the team itself. So one of the teams that I worked on uh, came up with this thing that I call a pair programming star. So here comes the audience participation thing. So in this team, who is the person who might not be doing a, such a great job? Yeah. Sergey, uh, that's, um, uh, that's a good guess, but it's wrong, but you'll still get a chocolate. <laughs> All right, who did you suggest? Johannes, yes. Why is Johannes doing a bad job? Exactly. So he's not spreading the knowledge. All right, so I, I gave you a hint there. Who's doing the best job in the team? Delipa, why do you, uh, so uh, uh, who said Delipa? All right, <laughs> okay. All right, so who, why is, uh, so um, somebody, uh, why is Thomas doing a good job? He's pairing with everybody. Great, oh, sorry. So uh, Thomas helps spread the knowledge in the team. And in this team, by putting this on the whiteboard of the team, Everybody knew what the rules were and what the expectations were. So it doesn't have to, we don't have to tell people that they're good or bad. Maybe Johannes had a very good reason for working with, uh, only with the Lipa. But it is a, um, it shows us what's going on in the team. This one is more complex. So here we got some user stories. So add a new company, display contacts on the map, filter contacts in the list, authenticate user by company, store passwords securely, and usernames with Norwegian letters are not displayed correctly. So this has to do with companies and contacts and something with users. So this seems to be a user thing. So um, which of these stories would you, oh, now, I, yeah. So <laughs> which of these stories is in the red? Which of these stories would worry you? Last one, yeah. Why? You're right. So only Thomas knows anything about it. Now, in this case, is this a problem? What do you think? Yes? 
Is there any reason it might not be a problem? It depends on the working world. And this sounds, it says Norwegian names with Norwegian letters are Neruka, except under Neruka it says uh, displayed incorrectly. This is a bug report. So, so, it, so it might not be a problem. It might be a small task. It might be something that's covered. But at least it's worth paying attention to. All right. So um, when we look at the team members, who do you, which of these team members would you say is doing a good, uh, like, who, which of these team members should we applaud? So, yeah, so people like Thomas, he's doing a good job. He's going all around there. Um, now, uh, is there any other p uh, person who's doing a good job? Because I have someone else in mind here. Uh, why, why do you like Arunas? So, the, all right. So, can anyone see why I like uh, Sergey here? Without Sergey, this would be two teams. So we're also looking for people that bind the team together. So, so Sergey is also uh, in the green here. Now this is uh, now all of this is sort of things to discuss. So it isn't right or wrong. It is tools that help us uh, bring forward what we mean by sh by knowledge sharing as a goal. So the first thing is to make knowledge sharing as a goal, and then there are some problems. So some of the problems that might get in the way to do proper pairing. If you have a task tracker tool that assigns one person to a task, and especially if it assigns one person to a task in the beginning of a sprint, that absolutely kills um, a pairing. So um, if you have a true team, then no team member can own something that's happening in the future. So if I have five tasks that I'm waiting to do, then I will not help uh, Budima complete his task, because then I will not do my tasks, right? So what we uh, like to do is to have a, what I like to do is to have a scrum board that has the option of having more than one person at the task. So anyone can only be on one, one uh, uh, sticky note, uh, most sticky notes have two people, uh, and some people might not be uh, on the team today. They might be on vacation or sick or whatever. And the things that we haven't started doing yet don't have someone assigned to it. And um, how many heads do uh, you guys have? Who's got more than one head? All right. So who's working on more than one task at the same time? Everybody, we should be working on more than one task at the same time. So, okay, you'll get one for clearly, yeah. So, we can't work on more than one thing at a time. So, um, we shouldn't be assigned to more than one thing at a time. So, if we do things as a pair, we will get more done. The teams that I've seen do this get more done and quite dramatically, but it doesn't happen in the first or the second sprint. So the, th the third obstacle that we encounter, especially in a uh, uh, context here in Asia, is distance, because we very often work with teams in other parts of the world. And so many people have talked about distribution already, and there's really three things that is key to good collaboration across distance. One is that we need to see each other, so the video. The second is to need, we need to see what the other person is seeing, so screen sharing. And the third thing is that we need to work on the same, um, uh, we need to share the work that we're doing. We need to work on the same thing. In this context, I used Skype to talk to Niruka um, and do the um, uh, video sharing. I used GoToMeeting, um, which is a flexible screen sharing tool to flip the screen back and forth. And we used Dropbox to uh, synchronize the files in the background. This is a setup that works extremely well um, if you, don't want to, if you don't want to wait for keyboard stro uh, strokes to come back and forth across the world. So it's a very good and low friction way to get started with something. There are many good tools out there and new tools are coming every day, but it's, it's more important to get started than to choose the best tool for the job. Um, 
The last thing about pair programming is that it requires you to build up skills. It is a learned ability. You don't, uh, Niruk and I didn't pair this well the first time we tried it. Um, so in order to do that, you um, might want to do experiment um, with different kind of switching patterns uh, to try out ping pong programming because it's a great way to practice and learn better ways of doing it. And also when you are pairing to not force your idea through but instead um, be flexible in trying the other person's idea quickly because that way you don't spend a lot of time arguing which so many people when they get started remote, uh, with pair programming spend a lot of time arguing. Niruka will be back soon. Uh, all right, um, or he might not. <laughs> Now he's calling me on my phone. Um, all right. And the last thing, when you start doing pair programming, you will be extremely tired, exhausted. It's really tiring. Um, if you do it uh, like um, for real for a week or two, you'll, it'll be the hardest week of your life. But after that, it'll be all fun. So, um, a good way to get started is when you're sitting down and fix a bug and you don't know exactly what it is, ask someone who knows the technology or knows that part of the code to come over and help. Train with someone. There you can do training events. I noticed uh, there, is a, uh, there has been a code retreat in uh, Bangalore um, many years. Uh, there was a C42 organized one just a couple of weeks ago. This is a code retreat we did in Sri Lanka two years ago. It's a great way to, to practice programming, to get to know more people, and to uh, learn how to do pair programming. And what we did now was uh, called a coding culture, uh, which is a practice form. So we do, you work on the same problem over and over again to get better. So this is how you get started. You create a Dropbox account if you don't already have one. You share a folder on Dropbox with a friend. You put a coding project there. You create a screen sharing session. Oops. Uh, you call up your friend and you share the screen with him and you share the code with him. And then you can do ping pong like this. And a final way to get started is to set aside a time per week to sit down and do pair programming. The one thing I would like to say is don't look around too long for the perfect tool. I've given you one tool. If you don't have any other tool that you know will work, then try that out. And then find new, better tools as you go along. And just get started. So to conclude my talk, what is pair programming? Pair programming is two people working out the same code base. It is uh, no team member owning a task beyond the day that they're working on. So we rotate on the tasks, and it's about team rotating pairing. That's when you get that effect where you have the team where everybody gets help and everybody starts becoming, um, seeing the big picture. With pair programming, uh, you get less overproduction because you don't make that unused API that the other people weren't going to use anyway. You have le spend less time waiting for the person who has the right skill. You spend less time doing uh, silly things with your tool because you learn from each other how to use your tools better. You have fewer defects as two eyes see better than one. You do less of extra work because people uh, don't know what the other person was doing, so they do it twice. You have less unfinished stuff because the team can work on fewer features and get done with those faster. And you have less handoffs between team members as, as you try and develop something. So does anyone recognize this list here? Lean, yes. Very good. Chocolate for you. <laughs> 
All right, so the, these are the seven wastes of lean, and these are the seven wastes of lean applied to pair programming. How do you get started? Ask for help. Don't work alone. Play with ping pong programming, and just set aside two hours with a local friend or a remote friend to work on a problem with ping pong programming. When you do it, be open to learning new things and sharing your knowledge with your friend. So, who? <laughs> All right, I think you were first. <laughs> and. <laughs> All right, so. We'll take away this. A team creates together what no member could do alone. So, the winners, or who wants to fight for the prizes, come up here after the talk. <laughs> so a team craves together what no member could do alone, and that's how I define a team. Thank you. Do we have more questions? No. All right, so I'll hang around if anybody has questions, or if anybody wants to pair program with me, for the rest of the conference and grab hold of me. Thank you all.